Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody back to our continuing series on exodontia for the general dentist. Uh, we have a couple of tips today on uh, certain select teeth that uh, we commonly encounter in our practice and uh, hopefully it will prove beneficial for you. Um, well, the first teeth I'm going to do today uh, is going to be the uh, maxillary molar. Uh, particularly, we're concerned about isolated maxillary molars, uh, particularly in older people. As you know, the uh, Sometimes you can have full pneumonization of the sinus and the bone's very compromised and if you just grab it with the forceps and torque it out, uh, you'll end up with a very large oral antral opening. So uh, with these teeth, if they don't come out real easily, uh, I always find it's best to go ahead and, and section them. Now, uh, if you just take out one root at a time, you only have to apply theoretically one third of the force you would if you took out the whole tooth at a time. And if you do have an opening, you only got an opening through one root rather than all three roots. So for a number of reasons on these isolated teeth uh, with a uh, large pneumonization of the sinus, it's probably best to go ahead and uh, section them. Uh, here's a roadie graph of the tooth that we're looking at today. Uh, nothing extraordinary, typical maxillary molar. Uh, I want to discuss what the classical technique is for extracting these isolated teeth. And uh, I hope you can see my diagrams. They're a little crude and primitive here. So you have the typical uh, maxillary molar. Now we're looking at this from the mesial surface. P stands for the palatal surface, and of course the other one's the facial surface. Typically they will tell you to make an incision right at, at the height of the alveolar crest, about halfway through the tooth, cut off both the buccal roots, and then after you do that, uh, you grab the uh, palatal root and try to extract the whole teeth. Well, there's a couple problems with that. Sometimes what will happen is the tooth will not break exactly where you want it to break because as you notice, uh, the furca does not go all the way up to the alveolar ridge, so there's always a big chunk of bone that hasn't been cut yet. So you hope it'll break down through there to the furca, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it just breaks off right over to the pile root, and then you have a big root stump there and no way of digging it out. The other thing that happens, even if it does go as planned, uh, what you end up with is our two buccal root tips broken off right at the gum line. Well, I don't like digging out root tips, and basically that's what you're stuck with. They're, they're not that difficult to get out, but uh, I find it's just a little more work than I like to do. I have another technique I, I use. I look at looking at it from the occlusal view, if you can see here, I, I separate the buccal two roots from the palatal root. And instead of going straight across here, I do kind of a semi-lunar cut like this. I want to maximize the amount of tooth structure that's left on both the, the uh, mesial buccal and the distal buccal crown because they're a little bit fragile and if they're too small, they'll just snap right off. Once I separate the whole buccal half of the tooth from the palatal half, then I'll go ahead and I'll separate the mesial part from the uh, distal part. Once you do that, then it's a pretty easy uh, proposition just to take out. You can loose, get an instrument in between those, loosen those two buccal roots, loose, they're already loosened from the palate, and just take those out individually. Then what you're left with is a palatal root, which you can usually grab with a small instrument. Uh, the forceps that I like to use is a, a 6-9, which uh, looks a whole lot like a set of rongeurs. If you can see the 6-9, they're real small nibs on them and they're real tight and you can grab the palatal root that's remaining real easy with these. Uh, they look a lot like your rongeurs. Uh, if you have an old set of rongeurs, you may just put an X on it for exodontia, use that for your 6-9 uh, and then buy a brand new set of rongeurs. But you can get the palatal root out that way. And uh, from the facial aspect of it, as you can see, if you're looking at the facial aspect to make this big cut here, it's pretty easy to separate those two buccal roots from each other. And then since they've got single roots on, they're pretty easy to elevate. And then you're just looking, as you can see in the background, that dotted line there. Hopefully you can see that. That's the pile root. And again, you can uh, use an elevator or again, with a little 6-9 forceps, grab that and take that out. And that way you'd have to dig around for root tips on the buckle top. And uh, it just seems to work a little better in my hands. And of course, every tooth is an individual. So learn both techniques and use the technique that works best, best in your hands. So, We'll try to demonstrate that here with our uh, uh, extracted teeth models here. Now, I like to use, of course, and I think all of you like to use the uh, your standard handpiece that you use, uh, contractile handpiece. It's it's kind of hard to get the surgical handpiece back in there, and, and general dentists are more adept with this, and so it's an excellent handpiece. It's a really preferred handpiece. For this demonstration purposes here in the lab, we're going to use a straight handpiece, but uh, I would use a contral angle standard high-speed handpiece. Don't have to worry too much about air embolism here because we're not laying any flaps in there, but you can use a impact air if you want to if you're concerned about air embolism. 
again, I'm going to outline this in kind of a semi-lunar fashion. I hope you can see this. And I'm going to try to preserve the buck, make the buckle parts a little bigger than I would the uh, hollow part of the crown there because they tend to be a little fragile. This may take a little while here. So. <laughs> stuff off here a little bit. about one thing, the, uh, on this full pneumatization, as uh, older patients have a full pneumatization of their sinus, a lot of times the sinus will actually invaginate in between the three roots down in there. So if you go too far through the floor of the pulp, you could actually uh, make an artificial opening here. So uh, watch your measurements, your distance, take your x-ray, stop everyone's looking there, make sure you don't get to the floor of the pulp chamber. I'm going to go a little further with these teeth because they are dry, desiccated teeth and they tend to chip, so I'll probably do a little further cut than I would clinically in the mouth. Okay, I'm going to go just a little further because it's too pretty dry here. And uh, what I may do is, uh, probably wouldn't do this in the patient's mouth, I'm going to mark this with a little magic marker here. Hopefully you can kind of see the outline here a little bit better. I'm going to grab a photo of what I'll do is embed it. And I hope you can see the photo a little bit. It's, it's a little bit of a semi-lunar cut on there. I'm going to take a quick photograph. And Okay, hopefully that'll show it a little better. You can see it's kind of a semi-lunar cut in there. And now I'm going to continue by separating uh, the two teeth, uh, the two halves of the tooth. Just put your instrument in there, sir, and hold. Okay, and we're going to try to separate these without breaking these dry teeth here. Hopefully we got a good break here. to make excuses dry teeth do not operate the way <laughs> vital teeth or even root canal teeth. Okay, now what I'm going to do is separate the two uh, buccal roots, the measles and the distal half from each other. And again, you can see this would be a whole lot easier to do with a contra angle uh, high speed than using this uh, great big straight uh, either lab handpiece or your osteomed or, or strike or whatever sort of a surgical handpiece. So I, I, I prefer these. Again, you may use a, a air impact if you're concerned about air embolism, but if you're not laying any flaps or anything, it's usually not a concern. Again, I'll, I don't know if you can see this again, I'll darken this up a little bit on the outside and you can kind of see a little bit where you know, I've just separated the two buckle halves of the mesial and the distal and then uh, separate the pilot root from those. Again, I'll try to break the, uh, separate these without breaking too much. We'll see how it works here. Just put your, I like the uh, Cogswell A. Again, you just uh, bone expands slowly, so never get in a, in a hurry. This is not bone, but for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to go real slow here. That 
make it too tough for you. No, I think it's all right. It's just a matter of fishing out of here now. I'm trying to lose something for you. Here's what I rail over here. You want to get in there to get a good angle. I, I like I use the old molt number nine perio because it's got that little curved tip and I can work that around in a lot of different places. Uh, whatever works best in your hands here. Of course, you can't put a great deal of force on it with a number nine molt, but you can kind of exploit small spaces. Man. Okay, uh, usually I can get that out with an elevator pretty easily. Uh, again, I may just uh, go to the number 69 uh, force up a little early here. Again, these little narrow nibs will get down in a tight little area there. And one force I use, a lot of people do back and forth, mesial diffs, little buckle angle, but I also find rotating like a nut on a bolt works quite a bit too. You just expand the alveolus. Some of the sticky wax is sticking in the other part over here. We'll see how we do. buckle root. And there's our distal buckle root. Now when you've done that then oh, this one's starting to come out of the wax a little bit but you can see the whole paddle surface the paddle and the uh, buckle surface facial surface of the paddle roots there and so again it's a pretty easy thing to get down to that number six nine let's grab that guy. Works are that easy in the mouth, but <laughs> that's the way you do it. Uh, that's the way you're supposed to do it. It came out as you see the three, the two buckle pieces came out separately, and the crown's intact. I didn't have to go around and dig around digging out root tips out of there. And then uh, when you take the two buckle halves out, the paddle one is pretty well exposed. You've got that nice uh, buckle surface of the paddle root. Again, you can get down on that pretty easily with your number six nine forceps, and you can give a little rotation, a little twisting back, and uh, usually works pretty well. Not all 100% of the time, but uh, it's a different technique. Try that, see how it works in your hands, and uh, hopefully it will be a big benefit.